Women have been serving in the armed forces since the very beginning of our nation, often in disguise as men on the front lines and in the knowledge that they would be discharged if found out. Not to be stopped from serving in their country, they have joined in every American conflict from the revolution up to our current endeavors abroad. Of the currently serving 1.4 million soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines on active duty, more than 200,000 are women. The percentage of women at the service academies also continues to grow, and the U.S. Army has now graduated 12 women from Ranger School, has a female infantry company commander at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and over 600 women in infantry and armor jobs across five different duty stations. The Marine Corps has now graduated two female officers from its vaunted infantry officer course, and one of those graduates is now a platoon commander serving with two former Marines in Northern Australia. While the top tier of leadership, the three and four star flag officers are overwhelmingly male, the percentage of senior female officers continues to grow and almost 10% of one star generals and admirals are now women. The same can be said for senior enlisted leadership with over 10% of sergeants major and their equivalents uh, being female in 2019. Now that women are allowed into the combat arms, it's only a matter of time for the next generation of combat leaders to reach the strategic levels of leadership and all services. I'd like to introduce the leader from the Office for Military Affiliated Communities, Terrell Odom. Terrell is a U.S. Navy veteran who served as a hospital corpsman, known as DOC, alongside and with the United States Marine Corps. Terrell cared for his sailors and Marines on board ships, in the field and in hospitals, providing care to the sick and injured. Terrell has spent close to the past 15 years working in higher education, specifically with military-affiliated students. He has published research regarding veterans in higher education and currently serves on the American Legion's Military Credentialing Roundtable as an ambassador for integrating military experience into the workforce in higher education. Please join me in welcoming Doc Odom from OMAC and to our female veterans. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, David, for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Terrell Odom. I lead the Office for Military Affiliated Communities here at the University of Chicago uh, under the guidance of Bridget Collier, who is the spouse, uh, daughter, and granddaughter of uh, U.S. Army and Navy veteran, vet, uh, veterans, respectively. Uh, and I work in conjunction with two of my colleagues, uh, Mitchell Kitloss, the Associate Director of Equal Opportunity Programs, and Scott Velasquez, the dir Director for Affirmative Action on veterans initiatives across the campus. Um, Today's event, Women in Boots, is a program that embodies the university's core perspective of inclusion, diversity, and representation of unique skills and experiences. When you think of the term military veteran, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For some, it's a man who has served in the armed forces. You think of the American Legion uh, veterans, men, during the Veterans Day program or Memorial Day program. Uh, simply put, you see a male. Today, we will hear from some of the finest who have served uh, and how they continue to so serve those who wear or have worn the military uniform. In my military and professional career, I had the privilege of serving under one very prominent female veteran uh, and being supported by another. Uh, Admiral Nor Vice Admiral Nora Tyson, retired uh, U.S. United States Navy, was the first female to ever command an entire battle fleet in the United States Navy. Uh, when I knew her, she was Commander Tyson of the mighty warship, the USS Bataan. When I got out of the military years ago, uh, I received a letter from another uh, very prominent female veteran who is a true champion uh, for veteran initiatives across the entire country, the Honorable Senator Duckworth. At that point in time, she was the director for the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, and then naturally went on to Congress and now serves in the United States Senate. But I also wanted to note uh, that Senator Duckworth is the first um, woman uh, with a disability to be elected to Congress. She's also the first female double amputee in the Senate. And of course, she's the first senator to, to give birth while in office. Now I'd like to continue on to today's program and introduce our awesome panel and our moderator. Megan Everett is a director of veterans program for the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. She is a former service warfare officer in the United States Navy. As a director of the Veterans Program, Megan manages a grant portfolio focused on veteran employment to include education and entrepreneurship, behavioral health and wellness, and systems navigation. 
Megan served on the USS Jarrett, which is a fast frigate, uh, as part of Operation Enduring Freedom and the USS Denver uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Her last tour in the Navy was on personal exchange program to the Canadian Fleet Atlantic in Halifax. Megan serves as the community member on the Board of Governors for Rickover Naval Academy and Chicago Public Schools. She is an advisory board member for the Advisory Council on Veterans Affairs for the City of Chicago and the Illinois Veterans Advisory Council. She's a board member for the Veterans Leadership Council in Chicago and a political partner for the Truman National Security Project. She is also a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the American Red Cross of Chicago. Megan received her Bachelor's of Arts from Cornell University, receiving her commission through Naval ROTC. She holds an MBA from Penn State University and a Master's degree in Public Policy and Administration from Northwestern University. Beth Kubala, Colonel Kubala, serves as the Senior Director for Strategy and Performance for the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University. Her role is to provide program management, leadership, compliance, expertise, and creative effort to support strategic initiatives within the community engagement portfolio. Before joining IVMF, uh, Colonel Kubala retired from the U.S. Army at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel following 22 years of active service. She served in numerous staff and leadership positions throughout her military service with her last assignment as a military judge while stationed in Fort Drum, New York. As an Army lawyer, Beth initially served as an administrative law attorney, ethics counselor, and prosecutor at Fort Hood, Texas. Later, while assigned to the Pentagon, she served as a legal advisor to the Army's Inspector General, and then as a legal advisor to the Army staff in the Office of the Judge Advocate General. From the Pentagon, she performed public affairs, media spokesperson, um, and commissioned trials at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. During an overseas tour in Germany, she served as an executive officer for the Army's Europe Legal Office. For a final assignment in the Army, again, she presided over military court martials uh, cases at mil uh, as a military judge at Fort Drum, New York. Uh, Beth is a graduate of the United States Academy at West Point, Military Academy at West Point, forgive me, uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law, and then the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. She is married to another Army veteran, retired Lieutenant Colonel Mike Kubala, and they have three children. Dr. Jacinth, I'm sorry, Cynthia Jacinth joined the U.S. Army as a reservist to help pay for college. She served as a licensed practical nurse during her time in service and continued that passion upon discharge in the military. Dr. Jacinth graduated from SUNY Downstate Medical Center Midwifery Program in 2007 and from Chamberlain University's Doctor of Nursing Practice Program in 2017. She has worked as a midwife in various settings, including private practice, a small federally qualified health center, and a major metropolitan city's public health hospital system. She currently brings her many years of experience and passion for women's health to her role as the director of midwifery at U Chicago's Medicine, where she oversees a team of seven midwives, seeing approximately 1,200 patients per year and they delivered 180 births last quarter. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she encourages women to be active participants in their reproductive health and educates her patients at every opportunity. She has a special interest in teen and adolescent reproductive health and empowering young women about their bodies. Most importantly, uh, Cynthia believes in listening to women and taking the time to discuss their concerns both medically and socially. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with families, if she has any, right, um, and getting to do things around the city of Chicago. Ann Treadway is an Army veteran who served two tours in Iraq. She is responsible for the development and coordination of a comprehensive program of support services for veteran students at all three campuses of Rutgers University. She also serves as the principal advocate for student veterans ensures the quality of policies, programs, activities, and services designed to enhance their educational experience, and also serves as the university's liaison with outside agencies and offices whose work impacts the lives of veteran students. Anne received her Bachelor's of Arts in History and Political Science uh, from the State University of New York Purchase College, and a Master's of Arts in American History from the College of Staten Island City University of New York, 
and she is currently pursuing her doctorate degree in higher education, and she travels the country as an advocate for and professional speaker for female veterans. Bridget Altenberg is the president and CEO of National ABLE Network. Bridget's career includes experiences in nonprofit and for-profit sectors. Prior to becoming CEO of National ABLE, Bridget served as the chief operating officer of National ABLE, the executive director of Chicago Cares, and she directed development, marketing, and communications for the Academy of Urban School Leadership, which we know in Chicago as AUSL, uh, where her work was recognized by former President Obama as the national model for education reform. Bridget began her career as an engineer officer in the United States Army, where she deployed to Bosnia, Albania, and Germany with soldiers to conduct engineering operations in Bosnia. Bridget earned a BS in Russian and French from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and an MBA from Columbia Business School in New York. And our moderator, Anita Smith is a U.S. Army veteran and a spouse of a U.S. Army veteran. She has actively contributed to the University of Chicago for the past 13 years, stewarding financial management at both University Communications and currently here at the University of Chicago Law School, uh, working with staff to launch new and innovative financial modeling and project management tools. She has worked on veteran initiatives for the university since its conception in 2010 and currently serves as a founding member of the university's Veteran and Family Readiness Program and an advisor to my office uh, in OMAC. Anita Lee's efforts to recognize and enhance visibility for veterans and attract talented veterans to join the community, encourage veterans in outreach across the university and throughout Chicago, and help strategically implement resources for the families within the military affiliated community at University of Chicago. She is a member of the Midwest Finance Association and Veterans Leadership Council, She's extremely passionate and committed to helping others. She is often sought out uh, for presenting at various events throughout the Chicagoland area for veterans and their families. So please join me in welcoming our panelists as well as our moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. You know, November is National Veteran and Military Families Month. It's a time to acknowledge the tremendous sacrifices our military families make. So I can think of no better way than to continue the expanded services of the University of Chicago for Veterans uh, Day in the month of November than to have this discussion with Women in Boots. So to make sure we have time for the audience to ask questions at the end, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, this first question, I would ask that, you know, I'll give each of you will have opportunity to answer this question, and we'll start with Megan. Can you tell us why did you choose to join the military? What was your job assignment? And tell us a little bit about your most memorable experiences in the military. Sure. <clears throat> um, thank you for having me here and on this amazing panel. A lot of New York State connections. <laughs> I mean, every, almost Everyone everybody's else, like yeah. went to school somewhere in New York. Um, and thank you, Terrell, for putting this together. And to all the other women veterans out here, um, thank you for your service, and to all the veterans in general, I'm sure. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge Director Chapa Lavia, our director of uh, the Illinois Department of Veteran Affairs this year. Thank you. Um, so why I joined? Um, a myriad of reasons, as I'm sure many people did. I grew up, uh, my father was in the Air Force, um, so I was born on an Air Force base. And uh, he, we moved 11 times before I started college um, on my Navy ROTC uh, adventure. So it was pretty ingrained in me. It's, it's how I grew up. Um, and I, just, I remember being in high school uh, my junior year. We just moved to off the Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. So I did the two different high school thing as an as a Air Force brat. And just having the discussion with my parents about what was next for me, I was looking at um, you know, my, my, my parents' motto was try to get to the biggest um, and best and highest court that you can. So I was applying to pretty uh, tough schools back then. And, um, and uh, my dad kind of threw the idea out there, is he, would you consider applying for ROTC scholarships? And my initial reaction was like, no way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not for me. But as I explored it and, and investigated more on my own and what ROTC and, and what that could offer me, um, when going to college, 
uh, I, I decided that it was something I'd wanted to pursue. Now remember this was, um, so this was, I graduated high school in 1996, so this was 95-ish, so you know, a lot changed certainly um, from when I got commissioned in May 2000 and then with 9-11 happening. Um, but certainly when I embarked on my uh, my journey with with na the Naval ROTC program at Cornell, um, it was something I knew was a place where I could be part of a team, I could, uh, the camaraderie was really important to me, the leadership opportunities, um, and the ability to serve um, serve my country um, while after I graduated from college. So those were my main motivations. It wasn't, you know, something I woke up or, you know, was dreaming about as a young girl, but certainly my upbringing, my father's influence, and then um, doing ROTC at Cornell was, was a, a big influence. Uh, my main role, um, like Terrell said in the intro, I was a surface warfare officer, and for those that aren't um, Navy familiar, that's basically a, um, a ship driver. So uh, I drove big ships, um, and I think the, just bringing the woman perspective, at the time that I was in, the first, uh, the first both ships that I served on um, were all male crew. So they were both ships uh, that were built, one was built in the 80s, the frigate was, and then the, I was on the Denver, which is an amphibious ship built in the 60s, and believe it or not, it was a steamship. Um, and so there was four, four women officers on, on um, my first ship, and then seven women officers on my second ship. Um, the rest of the whole crew was male, so that means 350 males on the frigate, and then about 400 male crew on, on the USS Denver, and then we embar embarked 1,500 uh, male Marines. So we <laughs> joked on the Denver that the seven women on board where we were like unicorns. Like when somebody <laughs> spotted us, they're like, there is one. Um, and uh, <laughs> she exists. Um, so uh, without taking up too much time, because there, you know, I do have some unique experiences. I did deploy twice to the Persian Gulf after 9 11, um, but I can share some more, some more of those later if, if, if time has it. So I don't want to take away from the, the other wonderful women up here. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thanks. And um, I echo everything Megan said at the beginning. Thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks for hosting us. It's so, um, it's so nice to see all the various initiatives here um, at this school and the initiatives nationwide to support veterans, family members, military connected. It's, um, it's a great effort, and I applaud you with that for that, Sorrel. Um, it kind of it's very similar to what Megan said. You know, we're, we all came from different backgrounds. We all had some similarities. Um, my dad was an Army Reservist. We grew up outside the D.C. area. I knew that I, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I knew I wanted to be a part of something um, bigger than myself and more exciting than just, you know, the state college that everybody was going to. So I had an opportunity to learn a little bit more about um, West Point and the academies. And prior to going, instead of going straight into West Point, I went to the prep school for a year first to kind of test the waters. And that was a great um, opportunity to get myself ready physically, uh, mentally, educationally. And I also went into West Point with a, about 100 other friends. So a great support system there. Um, and really enjoyed my time at the academy. Was in the same company as Bridget. So these bonds <laughs> run strong. And um, uh, later served as a military intelligence officer. While I was at West Point, though, I felt myself drawn to a family who was my sponsor. The husband was my computer professor, and the, his wife was a law professor at West Point. So I really admired her. Um, kind of, she was kind of a unicorn to me then. She had, they had kids. They were a married couple. She had a career. Um, and so I was just really drawn and took as many of the kind of pre-law courses that they offered while I was a cadet there. I had the opportunity to apply once I served a couple years as um, an intelligence officer, applied for the Army's funded legal education program. So while I may not have been intended to stay an entire career on day one, that's what ended up happening. So the Army sent me to law school in uh, Kansas City, uh, great experiences there, and then I joined the JAG Corps. And I think I also felt a real sense of belonging. There was a high percentage of um, women in the Army JAG Corps. Uh, intelligence was a good field, but the JAG Corps was even better. And so I enjoyed um, all the d different experiences and duty stations and jobs. Um, yep, and jobs that I uh, had the opportunity to pursue as an Army JAG. I think, um, do I need to turn it on? Turn it on? 
It's on. It's on. <laughs> it is on. I'll keep talking and you tell me if I need to do something different. <laughs> if I need to move it, just give me a little signal. Move it a little bit. Move it a little bit, a little up higher. Is that better? Just keep letting me know. I think it's on. You want me to turn it off? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to hold it in your hand? Sure. Closer to my mouth? OK. <laughs> um, uh, I think one of the big highlights of my career was having the chance to serve as a military judge at Fort Drum. Um, I was the first win woman judge to be stationed up there at Fort Drum, kind of all on my own. Uh, my boss was in the DC area. But I really got a good glimpse into um, you know, the, the situations soldiers can find themselves in, the dilemma command is faced with, with how do you handle, um, how do you handle misconduct? Do you send someone to court? Do you try to rehabilitate them? Um, it was a really good experience and really opened my eyes to um, how those processes can really affect one person's life at the end. Um, so I have a little bit of an update to my biography since uh, I got here. Um, as of Monday, I'm directing the legal clinic at Syracuse University's College of Law. And so I think all of, all of those experiences and what I've done at the Syracuse's Institute for Veterans and Military Families have really kind of all cum culminated and I look forward to serving in a new capacity and um, you know, learning new things and uh, taking all the tools in my toolkit and putting them to their best use. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. So now, Dr. Jacin, let's go to you. First of all, thank you for having me. I feel so honored to be part of this amazing panel. Um, my military background is a slightly different from these two women. I started my, mid my um, military career, I think my first semester out of high school, out of college, in, into college. So I enlisted because I needed money for school. I was the daughter of a single mom. I am first generation Haitian American, so my parents are from Haiti, and I was the first person to actually attend college. And at the time, of course, you know, college is very difficult to pay for. And I found out about uh, the military and I actually enlisted as, an, I was already a nurse prior to enlisting, so I was already ranked at like an E5 or sergeant at the time. And that was like what kind of draw me, drew me to it. So I enlisted, I had an LPN, I went on to get my bachelor's and master's and now my doctorate. So I did my um, reservist training and everything. So I just continued on with, with the military in that sense. And I've worked with veterans throughout my career, which I didn't even know I had veterans in my, um, with female veterans throughout my career. So it's a little bit different with, from these women. It's more, more on the civilian side, the reservist side, but I, I did go in initially just to help me pay for college and, and just continue my nursing career. Okay, thank you. And? Uh, I also slightly different. I, I enlisted uh, during college, actually, um, and not because I was an overachiever, which everyone on this panel outside of myself is. Um, I was a bartender in college. Uh, I could make it to a keg party, but could not make it to that 8 a.m. class. So that should tell you what my GPA was hovering around. Uh, and across the street from the bar was a recruiting station. Now my father had enlisted during Vietnam and my brother was in at that time uh, in the army. I was already 21 years old and the recruiters would come in and, and tell me about each branch. And one day I, I realized I needed one, more money for school because it was gonna take me a little longer. And I also needed some discipline because I wasn't about to spend any more money on school if I wasn't going to do my best there. So uh, I enlisted at 21 right before 9-11. I actually graduated basic training two days after 9-11. So what my experience was, I initially listed as a reservist, it quickly changed. Uh, I picked carpentry and masonry to be that specialist. It's not a lot of women uh, in, in the engineers, and I did serve with mostly men. Uh, but I picked it because I had the largest bonus, and I liked working with my hands. See, all of this sounds less, you know, noble. Um, I'm very handy, by the way, so, and I still do that. Uh, so I, I did the reserves for two years, and then I volunteered for active duty just as a, actually right before we uh, announced that we were going into Iraq. So my timing generally was off when it came to the service. Uh, and so I went to active duty. I got to Germany, and so I was based out of for three years. Unfortunately, I, well, out of those three years, I spent two of them in Iraq. I was in uh, 
Baghdad in the initial wave in 2003, and in Mosul uh, in 2005. Uh, and then after I got out, I went back to college. You know, I used the GI Bill. I was a much better student. Um, you know, graduated with honors, got a master's degree after that, and now again working on my doctorate now. Uh, and I work with veterans professionally. But uh, memorable moments as far as in the service. Um, you know, when I was deployed my second time, and I think everyone probably has something similar that they experienced. Um, there were phones during my second deployment that you could actually use to call home. So every two weeks, I would walk a pretty far distance on the forward operating base that I was stationed at to get to the uh, MWR, right, to wait online for a half an hour on the phone, and I would call my grandmother every two weeks. And I would call my grandmother because my mother would always get very upset, and so most of the call was her crying. <laughs> and my father was very, like, you would think I was in the next room because I think that's how he handled it. So my grandmother was perfect because she would just talk about random things, going shopping, everything. <laughs> Uh, and without fail, every two weeks. And it was in that time that I realized uh, during the service that what, priorita what priorities were in life. You know, how very simple things can change, uh, how you can lose someone very quickly, um, every moment counts, and really uh, invest in dedicating time to the people in your life, your family, your friends, uh, and appreciating the time you have. So I think that was my, I just remember doing those walks and learning a lot of you know, have appreciation. Um, for just life in general. Thank you. Bridget. So um, I'm a seventh generation Army brat. Um, actually, my uh, ancestors came over. They were defected during the Revolutionary War, so they actually fought for the wrong side. <laughs> don't, don't hold that against me. Does anyone, everyone know what a brat is? Because we're like almost all brats. You know what it stands for? Born, raised, adapted, transferred. So it just means we moved around a lot. Um, and my, I had, I was, I wasn't sure how to pay for college, so I knew I was going to have to do some kind of ROTC or thing. But I did not have any intention of following my career military dad into the army. Um, but he did do a great job of surrounding me with JAG, uh, women JAG officers. And if you ever want to see a badass, you need to meet some women JAG officers. They're the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. And I think back to Sarah Green, who was somebody that I looked up to. And so even though I didn't mean to go to West Point. When my dad deployed to Desert Storm Christmas my senior year, it changed everything in my mind about going to Amherst and <laughs> going to a little small liberal arts college and uh, living a totally different life. And so I ended up going to West Point as a result of that experience and seeing how the community in Germany came together when you know the entire, uh, the entire community was deployed. And the only people, I mean, I had senior classmates who were taking care of their little brothers and sisters because both mom and dad were deployed. So I saw what that meant, and it, it sort of made me appreciate what my dad had taken us through as a community, um, as a family. And, and so it inspired me to serve and go to West Point. Uh, and that was the first time I realized when I was going to West Point that um, the JAG Corps wasn't what the Army was. <laughs> uh, and I remember thinking, what do you mean? I I, I, I can't go infantry? Well, now I want to go infantry. So I chose the next best thing, which was engineers, because I got to blow shit up. Am I allowed to say shit? <laughs> I got to blow shit up, so I, I got to blow shit up a lot. Um, I'm going to say it all the time now. Um, and, and, and it was great. And I, I ended up getting out, uh, uh, not because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I didn't get kicked out, but I, I chose to, not that it matters, but I, I chose to get out. And my, fun, my funny story is what, my wife always says, when I'm 80 years old, I'm going to be sitting in a rocking chair with a VFW. I don't even have a VFW hat, so I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> on the front, going, I lived in a tent with 10 men and changed in my sleeping bag. And, and yeah, so as an engineer, there's not a lot of women. And so I lived in a tent with 10 men. <laughs> And it's my, it is, I get to tell that story. It's going to be my go-to whenever my kid whines. I lived in a tent with 10 men. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Um, and I will not be saying shit. So. <laughs> she, she just did. <laughs> okay, so um, um, Dr. Joseph, can you talk to us a little bit about your opportunities after service? Tell us. How did you feel upon discharging from the military? And what was your transition into civilian life like? So my transition um, after discharge was a little bit easier because, again, like I said, I'm, I was a uh, reservist, so I was 
stateside for most of my career. I didn't. I never got deployed. I didn't go to Iraq. I didn't do any of that. So that transition was a lot easier for me. So, so my two weeks, I was living in Miami at the time. So my two weeks was, was was at the military air force base in Homestead, Florida. So I did my my two weeks there, my weekends there. So once I finished, I think at the time I was already. I had moved to New York at the time. I was working as a um, registered nurse in labor and delivery, and I began my midwifery education at that time. So for me, the transition was not uh, as difficult because, again, I was stateside for for most of the time. So it was a it was a lot it was a lot easier for me to kind of transition from military service to civilian life. Okay, thank you. And Megan, could you answer that same question after driving ships in yeah. the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> transition back into civilian life. Um, Mine, I think at the time I didn't realize it was um, not good, but um, like a lot of people don't, but on reflection it wasn't. Um, I um, did an exchange tour with the Canadian Navy, <clears throat> which was super cool, in Nova Scotia. Um, but this is, so I was separating in 2006 and I was stationed up in Nova Scotia. So um, the, those transition services that uh, aren't stellar still um, really were not good for me. So I was doing my, my transition assistance program class that everybody has to do um, in Maine um, at the closest base there, which had nothing to do with where I was headed or um, I'd never been to Maine before. You know, So a lot of those classes are tailored to the region where you're, where they're at, um, which is odd too, because most people don't stay where they're separating from. Um, so that wasn't super effective for me, um, and I was actually pretty uh, a little bit cavalier, kind of cocky about separating. I was like, it, "This won't be a problem." I drove ships, for God's sake. Somebody's <laughs> going to hire me, right? You know, like. But of course, when you move to Ohio, um, where there's no water, um, <laughs> they don't really understand that. And, uh, and I was working on my MBA at the time as well. Um, so I, I just I thought going into getting a job would be pretty, pretty simple. Now I was moving, I did choose to move to like a, a rural part of Ohio. It was with um, a partner that I had at the time, and he was doing his master's. So that was something that I did choose. But um, it took me over six months to get a job. Um, I was getting pretty desperate. I moved to, you know, again, a, a, and I think also being an Air Force brat, like moving so much, I was used to that kind of transition, but it was different. And in 2006, uh, the economy was starting to go down. Um, there wasn't much set up for veterans and employment in places like National Label, you know, and um, certainly not at universities yet because, uh, like, the post-911 GI Bill hadn't been passed yet. Um, so it, it, I ended up taking a job at a um, nonprofit working with adults with disabilities, um, doing job placement and uh, workforce development. So it was a very meaningful job, but it was an entry level job. And I took about a 70% pay cut um, from my military salary, plus with the benefits and our housing allowance and health insurance and all that good stuff that just are things you're not like super thinking about when you're 28 years old and mm -hmm. thinking you could kind of conquer anything. So um, it took me, you know, a while to really just build my career and not, I would never say dig myself out of a hole from that, that, that job that I took when I first got out of the Navy, but it did, it, you know, with my resume, then I was kind of in this entry level role. It's still hard to translate what I did when I was in the Navy. Um, I missed the camaraderie, you know, I left it just feeling that kind of sense of leadership and and that I was at the at the level that I should be at coming out of the military wasn't there. And, and I would say it took me a good, probably till I landed in Chicago in 2010, a good six plus years um, to kind of feel I was at a role. And even then, um, six years after when I moved here, well, it was four years after, I'm sorry. Um, I worked at Northwestern. Sorry, you Chicago. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing you Chicago colors, though. Um, and... Uh, for, for four years, but it you know it took really understanding and building a network, which I wasn't good at, which a lot of veterans aren't, um, to, to, to kind of bridge into the Chicago community and then um, the veteran community, which has been uh, a, a great uh, bridge for me, a great support for me, and um, and which is leads into the work I do now, and and we do a lot of funding for direct service programs. Um, from the McCormick Foundation, but a, another thing we do is to fund networks and build networks because 
having that place to land when veterans return and are coming back to Chicago and Illinois is really important because it can help launch them into a career at a level they should be um, or beyond or above um, before kind of things get bad. So, Okay, thank you. And you know, Megan, you talked about the camaraderie. And earlier, Beth, you talked about how you and Bridget were in the same company. So what I want to... But she yelled at me. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to ask next was, how um, have your relationships changed with other veterans and families since leaving the service? Um, or have they changed? And if so, how? And I'll start with you, Anne. Why don't you take that first? So I would mentioned that like a memorable moment was that realization and this uh, close attachment uh, to my grandmother specifically. But in some ways, it also, I got very clear about, you know, not having toxic people in my life and, you know, investing in people uh, who are investing in me as well. Um, I often joke with my wife about, like, I'd give my brother a kidney and she's like, not too fast. Uh, <laughs> um, but we're not close personally, but we, I love him, he's my brother, but we just don't get along very well, and uh, which is very common these days, right? So, um, so some relationships, I got very just black and white about things. Um, and also, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress for my service, and it, that comes out now uh, in my parenting to an extent, so I have twin boys who I've mentioned numerous times <laughs> as if I have nothing else going on in my life. Uh, so my, my sons are gonna be four in January uh, and something happened between three and four that has made them evil, but they're wonderful. <laughs> and, no, they're adorable, they're great. Um, but I have a lot of anxiety because of my post-traumatic stress around their safety. Mm. Uh, and I have to constantly check myself to make sure that I am not making them anxious, right, or imposing that anxiety on them. So I drop them off at daycare two days a week, and in the first 10, 15 minutes I leave, I have to negotiate with myself that nothing horrible is going to happen at the daycare, mm. right? Because, you know, I've, I've stayed because I've seen someone walk in just to be like, you know, it's another parent. And I understand <laughs> that that's ridiculous, and I've, you know, I have to go through this. So um, in some ways, it prioritized what relationships were really important to me. And, and making sure that they knew that, those people knew that. And in other ways, you know, I have to make sure that the effects of my service don't hurt, you know, the, the people close to me in, in my life. That I don't, you know, when I go into a restaurant, I, I like to sit facing the door and, mm -hmm. and certain things. And can I negotiate that with the people I'm with? So th that's the kind of changes in relationships that it, it, really, it really created for me. Thank you for that candidness. So, Bridget, what about you? Have your relationships changed with other veterans and family, and if so, how? Um, I'll be real honest. When I left the service and I went to Columbia in New York because I wanted to live in a big city and be out, um, I had no desire to associate with the military. I was like, mm -hmm. cut that off, moving on. Um, and it, it's only in the last, uh, I'd say, seven or eight years that I've really kind of come back to the veteran community. Um, I did miss the, I mean, I grew up as a kid in the military, you know, five o'clock, the, the flag comes down and you stop your car and get out of the car and salute. And that was a part of me. Uh, and so it took a while for me to recognize the good parts of the military and leave the parts that I was angry about behind. Um, so it's only been in the last seven or eight years that I've really kind of come back to the veteran community. Um, carefully selecting the people that, <laughs> that I that I kind of um, talk to and associate with, and and I'll say it's been really rewarding to kind of come. It's almost a homecoming for me to um, be reminded about why I, what I loved about growing up in the military, why I chose the path that I did. Um, so it's it's been very rewarding. Okay, thank you. And what about you, Beth? Um, very similar. Uh, I. I I felt the more senior that my husband and I got in the military, the shorter our assignments were at certain locations, so the quicker we were in, you know, in Germany, out of Germany. Um, and when I got to Fort Drum, uh, yes, I was, I had a great assignment as a military judge, but I had, all of my peers were scattered across the globe. So if I had questions, I could call someone and, you know, consult another judge, a more senior judge with questions, but I didn't have anybody down the hall. So it was kind of uh, a very isolating um, assignment, and it kind of was the, the right one to kind of put me in the mindset of, it's time to retire, we've done over 20, we're in a good spot, it's time to just move on to something else. 
But what was uh, really rewarding was um, we decided to stay in Syracuse, and I had learned about uh, Syracuse University's Institute for Veterans and Military Families, and I thought my, my previous plans were, well, we're going to go back to Washington, D.C., like everybody else, <laughs> and put on a suit and go work in the Pentagon as a civilian attorney, which also would have been a very rewarding opportunity, but um, I just realized that uh, there was an interesting thing going here on here at Syracuse University, too. And instantly, once I got um, integrated into that organization and met people like Megan and you know, met people across the country who were invested in pursuing uh, work to support veterans and their families, I just felt kind of a resurgence of that feeling of community. And it's been uh, rewarding also to be on the you know, cutting edge of initiating new changes in the, um, the TAP program and helping um, ease transition for service mem members, enabling spouses to pursue meaningful opportunities while their, spouse, while their military member is still serving. So it's been great to find a whole new community of some of the same folks and then of even bigger uh, you know, new people as well who are all kind of pursuing the same goals and the same, the same kind of uh, camaraderie that we had before. Okay, thank you. So I was actually gonna talk about um, ways that we can stay engaged. And so can you talk a little bit more about how has your current role allowed you to support military affiliated persons? Sure. Talk a little bit more about that. I kind of went into that already, but mm -hmm. you know, the whole mission of my organization is um, to serve those who serve. So. Um, pursuing initiatives for spouses who may um, need assistance in um, you know, finding meaningful opportunities uh, while they're in foreign countries or their, their uh, service member is deployed. Um, enhancing opportunities of, upon transition is a big one. And to even hear um, others' stories, you know, kind of trying to instill in the services that uh, even though someone raises their right hand to join the Army Air Force uh, Navy or Marines that they will get out someday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the services have to come to uh, a realization with that and to enable those service members to pursue um, higher education while they're serving, to think about careers after the military, to kind of let the reins loose a little bit. Um, so, you know, what we do day in and day out in my organization is, is just that. Um, so it's been very rewarding and also a little exhausting at times. Um, but uh, it's, it's just been uh, a wonderful alignment in keeping me connected with the community. Okay, thank you. And Megan, what about you? How has your role at the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, um, you know, allowed for um, some more support for the military-affiliated community? Um, well, <clears throat> it's all I do now, so <laughs> it's veteran and military family work. Um, but uh, it, like Bridget, and um, it was it was a path to get there. It wasn't what I I kind of wanted to step away. Um, I was from birth till 28, also military affiliated, and kind of wanted to figure out who I was without that. But um, and and I did that, and again, not so well necessarily. But um, but as I kind of you know wandered through my career. Um, working in a really rural, impoverished area with adults with disabilities. Then I worked at a high school for two years in Chapel Hill, at, in Chapel Hill running their service learning program and kind of was immersed into living in the South um, in, a, in an area with a lot of racial issues and kind of seeing how that impacted that, that community. And then ended up in Chicago and I worked at the Center for Civic Engagement and the Center for Leadership. Um, split between those two centers, which kind of was a nice uh, overlap of what my career had been, my wandering career had been thus far, um, but realized with kind of a social justice lens that the veteran population is impacted by all these same social issues um, that community is, but maybe even a little bit more enhanced because of our service and what we said, saw and did while we were overseas, depending on, on what your deployment was. And it kind of occurred to me that you know, I'm working on these social just justice issues in community. Um, I, I should be doing this for veterans, for my fellow population. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to start to build this veteran network within Chicago and, um, you know, from another veteran, Eli Williamson, who many people probably know. Um, 
he was working at the McCormick Foundation at the time, and he was the one that was able to bring me into uh, the McCormick Foundation and, and really kind of commit and, uh, to the veteran and military fam family population. And so um, it's something I get to do, you know, uh, as far as professionally for my work. Um, I associate a lot with groups outside of it. I've really, you know, despite being on a panel with all Army people, um, <laughs> I really like my other... <laughs> <Pick> <laughs> Had to get that in there, Bridget. <laughs> There's a big game coming up. Um, so, you know, just really find these, these wonderful people that are within the veteran community and then also be, you know, a mentor to those that are getting out and separating now so that their experience is a little bit more streamlined than mine, mine was, per se. Um, and, and also, I think something that's been big in the five years that I've been at McCormick is bringing in the family piece, which IBMF has always been good at. Um, but it wasn't necessarily in our strategy when I first started. We were very veteran focused, um, you know, that like employment and, and that was the core piece. But thinking more holistically about the veteran and the family and having in, been that family, you know, and watched my mom navigate that um, with, with my dad for 21 years. Um, I feel like that's been a, a big headway uh, into building our strategy out and getting our board and the people that I have to report to to really understand that that full piece. Well, thank you for doing that crucial work. And what about you, Anne? How has your role at Rutgers um, University helped to support military-affiliated persons? Well, what's interesting, actually, like Bridget also, when I got out, I wanted nothing to do with the military. Um, my father brought me to an American Legion post, and I was oh looking God. down, I know, and I was looking down the I have all these like, white, I know, white, <laughs> older men, nothing in common. Um, and if it wasn't during, it was during my grad work that the veteran center on campus, which had a part-time uh, coordinator and was trying to grow because of the big boom and, and students coming back, went to Human Resources and asked, did anyone apply to any job who identified themselves as a veteran? I, and I had applied to work as a, uh, in, the, in the library, actually, um, in the archives. Look at history, buff, good at bar trivia, by the way, really <laughs> wonderful. Um, so my, my resume was there, and, and uh, Ursula Eccles, who's the coordinator for that office, and actually currently works in my office now at Rutgers as well, uh, found me, and that's how I started working with veterans in general. Um, and it's common for veterans to get out and not want to associate with other veterans. And, and our job is not only just to serve them, but to educate those in the community around them. That's how I see my job at Rutgers. So I serve the military affiliated population, but then my other job is to educate everyone else because I'm not going to see every veteran, right? None of us are going to get those hands on with those individuals. So the more educated the community is, the better off they are. Right, who could direct them to the services, who know that we exist. Um, and Megan's right, the family. We always forget the family. Mm -hmm. And the military itself is a culture. It's accepted as a culture. And that culture extends and influences children of uh, service members and spouses. And I, a lot of services tend to just focus on either the veteran or the service member neglecting the spouse or child. So we do a lot uh, to make sure that's known and that our services cover the entire military affiliated population. Okay, thank you. Now, if given the chance to make changes to services for veterans and their families, what would you change and why? And I'm gonna um, address Dr. Jacinth on oh, this. Oh, you got the hard question. I sure <laughs> did. <laughs> So um, in preparation for this uh, talk, like I said, my background is a little bit different than the rest of the panelists. And being that I am a woman, basically women's health in middle free and I've always been in women's health and as a nurse and anything, everything like that. And this, since the focus is women in boots, I did my research and I noticed that there are, were not a lot of resources for women in terms of women's health and reproductive health in the military. I do have a friend who works also as a midwife in Virginia, but a lot of service women and their families don't even know that midwifery is, exists within the, the army or at different hospitals. And there's not even, even if we do exist, there's not that many of us. And a lot of our, the providers are not just only midwives, they're also advanced practice nurses. So just having those resources, having that out there to, for families, women, and anybody in the military in general to know that you have this resource as a, for an advanced practice nurse practitioner, for a midwife, for these individuals just to support your, your women's health. And like I said, there, I didn't find a lot of resources for reproduction, birth, um, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, mental health, I just didn't find that. So I think that's one thing I would change, even though I found that those numbers are increasing because, again, the numbers for, for uh, women in the military are, are also increasing. I still, that, that wave of resources not increasing at the same pace as the enlisted. So that's what I would change, just more resources and more visible resources for women and their families in the military in regards to their mental health and reproductive health. Well, thank you. And Bridget thought she was going to get out of asking this question, but she did not. Because, Bridget, I also wanted to hear from you if given the chance to make some changes um, for veterans and their families. Sure. Uh, to piggyback what the good doctor said, I, I, I do think there needs to be um, more thoughtful resources for women. Um, you need to get rid of the frickin' VA model, mm -hmm. motto. It needs to end, okay? I know it's Lincoln, whatever. It needs to go away. I mean, even my alma mater changed the lyrics of all of our songs so that they no longer say men and son. It's not that hard. Um, <laughs> it sends a message that women are welcome, mm -hmm. and right now we don't feel welcome. And so I would, we have a buddy system when we go to the VA. You go to the VA, I'll go with you because you don't want to spend your day getting ogled and deal with, oh, is your husband here? Um, so that needs to be number one. Um, and I think that um, both Beth and Megan touched on it, and Anne as well, is um, the flexibility. The flexibility that, of what service members need as they're getting out of the military. I tell people, you know, a lot of times I get frustrated because by the time people come to National Able Network, they're usually in crisis. Um, you know, 60% of the people that we serve are, are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, and there is no reason why a military veteran with the skill sets that we bring to the table should be in crisis. And so getting, getting to them earlier, uh, I tell people if you, have, if you know you're getting out of the military, spend the year before trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. I know there's not a lot of shit drivers in Ohio, um, <laughs> but figure out the, what are the transferable skills? Um, what do you want to be? What is the education and training that you need to, need to have so you can spend some time really thinking about how to use that GI Bill? Um, we really need to be more proactive, spend that last year. We're, we're making progress. We're making transition assistance pr program is better. Uh, we're giving people the option to go earlier. Those are all important improvements um, that need to happen, need to be even more. And then the last thing I'll say is getting the business community on board. As you can see, we are all military affiliated in some regard. Um, that is not what the business community consists of. Most people in, in the business community that are doing the hiring don't know a veteran, never met a veteran, never, don't have any idea what we bring to the table. And so getting businesses to take a chance on veterans, getting businesses to change their hiring practices, and this goes across the board for anything diversity inclusion related. The hiring process has become so specific, specific and uh, it's hard for anybody to get through the applicant tracking system and get to a real person. Um, and it is hurting more and more people that have the skill sets but just don't know how to network or don't know how to to you know, manage the system, which has nothing to do with the job that they'll do once they get hired. Um, and so businesses need to make those investments in, in making sure that they're reaching out to people that can help them connect to qualified veterans. Um, and we need to be, do a better job of being proactive um, as veterans or as people that serve veterans in making sure that when they get when they ETS, they know where they're going. And it's not, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna crash in mom and dad's couch and then I'll find a job later. It needs to be, we need to be more thoughtful, pro proactive, and flexible. Well, thank you so much, Bridget, and the entire panel. That is my questions. Um, we have about another five minutes or so where we can um, take questions from the audience. So do we have any questions? Go ahead. Because we have degrees that are 
evening program, one year program, two year program, but um, helping um, veterans get to a place where they can impact things on a policy level coming to one of our degree programs. Mm -hmm. So it's twofold. I really yeah. want to understand how to remove those barriers to entry for employment. And because we are a school, you know, what can we do to let people know that are leaving the service? This is a viable option for extending your service through the MPP. I have an answer at least for the first one. Um, uh, military cultural competency. We do cultural competency for a lot of different areas. Um, I was just at the Barron Summit, Barron's 100 Summit, and I went there specifically to speak to financial advisors about military cultural competency when it comes to hiring. Um, because studies, if I believe it, you could speak a lot to this specifically, because I think Syracuse has done these studies uh, with employers uh, and, and what HR representatives, recruiters, how they feel that, you know, they recognize there might be a bias um, and even though that there's uh, words that you associate with veteran like loyal and, and dedicated and driven and all, there's also negative connotations, right, to service members that influence the hiring, right? Uh, and service members and veterans are recognize that, are aware of it, and so they don't often want to disclose their military background for the fact that they think it's going to work against them. Um. We have found in some of our uh, most effective transition programs that we offer around the country that when you offer an opportunity for employers to meet a group of transitioning veterans in a not a not a formal type of interview, but more just a not even calling it a networking session, but we've we we run programs on over 18 military installations. And what we'll often do is have a group of employers come for an afternoon or an hour to simply meet the veterans in our program. That's meet the veterans in our program. Learn a little bit more about what they did. There's some spouses in our programs as well. Just an informal opportunity to uh, learn more about um, a room full of veterans so that you can then take that back and understand who the people you are, you know, going to interview down the road, you just know a little bit more. And same with the veterans, the, the transitioning service members in our programs, they need to meet some hiring uh, officials as well. They need to understand, you know, what that person's looking for, what the, the, the vernacular they use, the terminology associated with different jobs, the HR process. So I think um, on a, on a, on a uh, smaller scale, just having, you know, working with the resources you have here to uh, informally meet a group of veterans at, at some point to learn what their aspirations are and just learn more about them. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Any other questions? Okay, no questions? Then I am going to turn the program over at this time to David Finkel, but before I do, can we give the panel a round? Thank you to the panel once again. Uh, before I start my official closing remarks, I wanted to point out that we have um, some future female veterans in the audience. Uh, Lily Ramser, if you'd like to raise your hand, um, she's going to be joining as a Marine JAG uh, in the future next summer while most of my class is going to law firms uh, to make lots of money. She'll be going through Marine OCS. Um, Um, and then we also have uh, a couple students have inquired with me about talking with uh, some of you afterwards, uh, getting your contact information, because they too are now interested in uh, potential JAG careers. All right. Um, so officially, uh, females and female veterans have come a long way in the military and society as a whole. Uh, the right to vote, the right to serve, fair pay and the right to equal opportunity are all milestones that women as a whole have had to overcome. From the founding of the Nurse Corps, where females were allowed to care for the sick and injured, to non-combat roles, to now pilots, judges, doctors, commanding officers, lawmakers within Congress, and most importantly, rangers and infantry officers in the military. Uh, they are a true force to be reckoned with and owe these 
and we owe these heroines a debt of gratitude for their service to country first, but also for their forward thinking and shaping of operational readiness of our nation's forces. Thank you for coming to today's event. We have a wall of recognition in the Green Lounge if you'd like to go and post the name of a female veteran or any veteran in your family that you'd like to recognize um, by posting on there. Thank you very much.